It's also my second blessing today and introduce one of our own. He is the director of finance over at, uh, over at Dayspring Christian Academy. If you haven't gotten to meet him, you need to meet him. If, if you don't know, he's a former missionary to Israel. And I think it's so appropriate that, that we have uh, Garrett Cook, our own, our own pastor, who's over at Dayspring, who's going to share the word today, who is a former missionary. He's a husband and he's a dad. And please welcome him as he shares the word this morning. Blessings. Thank you, Dan, sir. Hey, thank you. Hey, let me just put one more plug in. Make sure you get this card. It's got the McCain's uh, face on it, where they're going. And it's going to remind you every day you look at this to pray for them. It's pretty important. Pretty important. Make sure you get one, please. Put it in your Bible. I'm going to put mine in my Bible. And uh, as missionaries, I'll tell you, money is important because we can't go unless we can get a plane ticket. But prayer is the most important. Prayer prepares the hearts to receive the word that brings them to Christ. But when you put some seeds, some actual money to your prayers, you participate in partner in watching God reach the lost. And so you don't just pray, you don't just give, but you also participate and you also go. We were talking about it earlier, either you're a missionary or a mission field. Someone's trying to reach you. Which one are you? My wife and I, uh, my wife, Helen Rose, we have four kids, the fifth in the womb, hoping for a girl, Adeline maybe. If not, maybe it's Asher or Titus. I don't know. God knows. God's knitting them together. And uh, we're just happy to be here. Thank you, Pastor Acklin and Miss Connie and the rest of the staff here. We uh, labor over at Dayspring. Awesome place. Really awesome teachers. Great students. And uh, God's hands there. Uh, you can see it. Uh, you see kids just growing in a relationship with Jesus. And what's better than that, right? Growing in a relationship with Jesus. And that's what Ian and Caitlin are doing. They're going to go spread the gospel so that people can have that opportunity like we've been given. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Father God, we bless your holy name. Jesus, we are so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful for uh, revealing yourself to us that we can know your name. We can speak your name, Jesus. And we thank you that we have access to come and pray, talk to you anytime, any day, any night. You're always there to listen, and you love to respond. You love to show yourself faithful and strong. And so, Lord, today we just pray that your word would impact our hearts and minds and transform our lives from the inside out. God, that our thoughts and our words and our actions would be Christ-centered and make a difference in this world because, Lord, you are worthy of it all. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise now in Jesus' name. All right, we can get the slides going. Today, we're going to talk about lost but found. How many of you have ever lost something special? Maybe a, a wedding ring? Anyone ever lose a wedding ring? There's a couple. Anyone else? Wedding rings? How about your glasses? That's, that's one. Lost. How about the car keys? Oh, yeah. Ooh, car keys. Thank God for those new little beepers. You can beep, beep. Oh, there, there's the keys. Talked earlier. How many of you have ever lost a child? Anyone? Isn't that gut-wrenching? Isn't that the worst feeling in the world? The first, like, 30 seconds. Where's Esther? Helen, where's Esther? And then it's like, where's Esther? Uh, aisle five, has anyone seen Esther? And, and it, it intensifies, right? It's kind of a scary feeling. But then they're found. And everything's like, whew, it's a relief, right? You find your glasses, you find your ring, you find your wallet. Miss Connie lost hers at Chick-fil-A. Thank God it was at Chick-fil-A. 
If it was anywhere else but Chick-fil-A, there would be nothing left in that wallet. Walmart, forget about it. They, people would have stuffed their bills in there. Man. But thank God, lost but found. And we're, we're just going through the scriptures with uh, Rabbi Jesus. Does anyone know what rabbi means? Teacher. Teacher. I said earlier, I could, have, I could see Jesus at day spring. Yeah, teaching Bible class. He is, and he is through our staff. He's teaching by his spirit. He's teaching students about who he is and the things he has in store for them. So we're going to look today at the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then we'll close with a, an actual story of Jesus seeking out and finding someone who was lost but then found. Lost sheep. So we're going to get into the scriptures in Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to read along with you. It's so fun to read Jesus' words in the Bible. It's called the red letters. Who loves the red letters, the words of Jesus? Man, so good. I'm going to read. Oh, there we go. Then, then all the tax collectors and the sinners to him, Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Hallelujah. Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. Praise God for that. Just don't let them lead the conversation, okay? <laughs> when you get there, make sure you're on mission. You're ready to exalt the name of Jesus. Lead the conversation. Watch what Jesus does. Jesus ignores that, convers- that, that comment from the Pharisees and the scribes. And then he goes to s- say a story. So he spoke this parable to them saying, What man of you... Having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner from Alaska who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Something to point out here, Pharisees and scribes, what did those people do for a living? They ate the word of God and memorized it. What happened to them? Doesn't the word of God transform a life so that we think and we speak and we act like God? What happened to them? Jesus, don't you know you're sitting and eating with sinners? They forgot. They were once a sinner that was lost. But thanks be to the word of God, they were found. Point one, never forget where you came from. By the grace of God, thank you, Lord, for saving a wretch like me. Lord, help us never become like Pharisees and scribes that say, why are you letting sinners into day spring? Well, maybe because once they hear the word of God and sit with a spirit-filled teacher, they're no longer going to be a sinner. They're going to be a a saved saint that is going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ And they're going to go out to India and Alaska and Israel and touch the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to be lost but found because of Jesus. All right, the lost coin. The lost coin. The lost coin. Hey, guys, what what do we exchange we get money. What do we exchange for to get our money? Anyone think about that? Time. Time. And what are you giving time of your own life? You're exchanging your life. Your life. The, the, the time glass is ticking. You're exchanging your life for money. 
And just remember, Jesus in these two parables isn't talking about how important the sheep are or how important the money is. He's talking about how important the loss being found is. So let me just point two, where are you investing your time and what are you doing with your resources? Think about that. Because investing in the mission of God, in the church of God, to spread the good news of Christ is pretty important, wouldn't you say, if the lost are going to be found. Luke 15, the lost coin. Or what woman, and so Jesus is just telling a story. He's got the Pharisees, the scribes, the sinners, the tax collectors. Jesus doesn't care. He just wants all to be able to hear what he's going to say. And then he goes on to point two. Or what woman having ten silver coins? She's worked really hard for these ten coins. If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the whole house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, we get excited about Tom Brady or the Bucks or the Patriots or the Red Sox. Man, what do the angels get excited about? The sinners, the tax collectors that were sinners sitting with Jesus. Don't you know who these people are? Getting all up in arms. The angels rejoice and go crazy in heaven, singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive all glory and all power and all praise to your holy name. They fall like dominoes before the king because one of those sinners comes into the presence of God. Hallelujah. What an what a eruption at a stadium when the angels of God go crazy because a sinner repents and comes into the kingdom of God to become a child of the, of the most high God. We were lost, but now we're found. Man, do you know that Jesus Christ left heaven for us? I mean, like, Jesus Christ was perfect and sinless. He didn't need to come down to this tainted, cursed world. But you know why he did? Because the Father had a mission and in that mission, God said, that lost sheep, that lost son, that lost daughter, Jesus, I need you to go like a Navy SEAL on, on focused mission, and I need you to get fully equipped, and I need you to be full of the Holy Ghost. I need you to rescue that son or that daughter. And Jesus stepped off his heavenly throne and said, yes, Father, here I go, born as a little baby to a virgin woman. Wow. Miraculous. And Jesus then lives a life, you know, almost murdered at, at, you know, at his birth. Herod, King Herod, wants to murder them and take them all out. You know, a pretty crazy story. Jesus goes through a pretty crazy life. But he learns God through the scriptures, and he, he grows in the grace and knowledge of God, and he lives a life perfect and sinless, so that when he dies, because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, that when Jesus Christ would die, he would shed perfect blood to forgive all the sinners of the world. Like God says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's right. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him they might be saved. God's mission sends his son to seek and to save the lost. Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16 says this. Then Jesus said, go into all the world. All the world. All the world. Sorry. And preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. 
Believes and is baptized. Baptism is so important. Make sure they get dunked. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be, con- will be condemned. I have a preacher friend. His name is Bishop Burnham Hall. He's with the Church of God, and he's been a pastor for as long as, uh, since a little kid, I think. <laughs> he's been preaching. He's been preaching the gospel. He's from Canada. And I had lunch with him on Wednesday. And we were sitting down, and he was talking. He said, you know, I started preaching the gospel as a young kid, and my mommy would be there, and she'd be praying over me, and she'd be right there. But my dad, he wouldn't be there. And he goes, I remember one time I was preaching all week, and my dad was out at the porch at one of those uh, meetings. And later on in the day, I went outside to meet him, and he said, you know, the dad said, everyone said you sounded pretty good today. And that was the compliment that his dad gave him. And for his whole life, he would preach the gospel and pastor churches, and his dad would always just be like, heard it was pretty good today. And that was it. But he never lived it out. And then Bur- Brother Burnham gets this call, uh, I think it was it's about two years ago, right around COVID time, and his dad's in the hospital kidney liver failure and or liver failure and uh, the doctors say you got to come it's pretty serious so he, brother Burnham drives all, all the way up there and it's it's pretty grim it's pretty it's pretty grim he's not gonna the dad's not gonna make it too much longer and so brother Bishop Burnham is praying he's like dad dad you know and the Holy Spirit told him to back off back off because this isn't getting down someone's throat right Anyone ever try to force this down an unbeliever's throat? How does that work? They come to Christ pretty easy? Can you get that down there anyway? And so he just prays. He's just praying. And then the Holy Spirit releases him and he says, now's the time to share. And so he's, you know, I think it was a week long. They were in the hospital together, you know, and just getting ready for dad to pass. And he's praying and then the Holy Spirit releases him and he shares. And as he's sharing, all of a sudden, Brother, Brother Burnham's uh, dad, light goes on. He goes, I believe. He goes, I believe. I really believe. And Brother Burnham would tell me later on, he's like, my dad was not an emotional guy. He was not emotional. But that moment in time, that moment in time, the light went on and faith arose. And he just said, I believe. Later on that day, he would take a shower, he'd come back, and guess what? Dad's gone. He's in heaven with God. Got to believe that Jesus baptized him on the way up. He believed. He was baptized into Christ. Isn't that amazing? See, we, folks, we don't ever know the time. We just, we don't know the time. But Jesus said, if you pray asking, believing in my name, and again, not for a Ferrari, and not for a wife, and not for a new car, and not for, yeah, we can, we can pray certain things at certain times, but God's not a genie. God says, if you pray my will, if you pray my word, if you pray that God's kingdom will come and will be done, it will be done. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and, and God's timing is in God's timetable. And we have to just participate in that process. We have to ask God, God, your mission your mission, what's my role in your mission? What are, you, what are you calling me to do? Who says we're called to pray? When you say we're called to pray, how many of you have, have lost loved ones that haven't yet believed? Please, how many of you? I need to see. We're going to pray at the end. How about friends, coworkers? How many of you know someone that's dear to your heart that if they took their last breath would not be in heaven right now, would not be with God for eternity? So we're called to pray. You can go to the next slide. We're called to pray. So this is, this is Luke 19, four verses after Jesus tells these parables. It could be within a short period of time that Jesus is walking after sharing those parables. 
and that this event happened. We don't know the timetable, but this happened shortly after Luke 15, Luke 19. This is what it says. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector. Chief tax collector. And he was rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was a short stature man. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus. For he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, who do you think they are? Pharisees and scribes. I wonder if they're all just a crowd just following Jesus wherever he's going right now because he's doing signs and wonders like crazy. Pretty cool. Raising the dead back to life. So they're all, everyone wants to see who this guy is. But when they saw it, Jesus welcoming Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said, To the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come. To what? But the, fi- the, the, the Pharisees and scribes said, Lord, he's a sinner. And what did Jesus say? Come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, I'll just tell you right now, I was, I was raised up in the church and I fell away. And for eight years, I ran hard away from Jesus. I was doing things that we don't even talk about in church. But I had a mom with two other single moms and a pastor on a Thursday night, and they just committed to praying night and day every Thursday for their prodigal sons to come back home. And I was in the midst of my sin on Halloween night. I was a party promoter in New York City, and I was doing the things again that I shouldn't have been doing that altered my mindset. But in that moment in time, I got sacked with the Holy Spirit. And I started weeping like a baby. And I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I am so sorry for the moment I did what I did to you, and I never saw you again for the past eight years. Mom, I'm so sorry for breaking your heart. I'm so sorry for cursing you out. I'm so sorry for being a rebellious, spoiled brat of a son. And my mom, she just says, son, I love you. I've been waiting for you to come home. It's not a matter of if, friends, with God, all things are possible. It's a matter of when. It's not it. Hallelujah. God is faithful. God is faithful. It's not a matter of if people are going to come to Christ in Alaska. It's not a matter of if pastors are going to be raised up. It's not a matter of if the gospel is going to spread throughout all Alaska and then multiply to the... It's when. And we talked early in the first service that when we pray believing in the name of God, that when we ask for Alaska to be saved, guess what God already did? Transaction done. Faith in that room just boom, done. So now I'm going to send up some people to go actually reap the prayer that they just prayed. On earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. All right, next slide. So how are we to respond? What are we going to do? God forbid, not, we can't follow the Pharisees and scribes. Folks, we can't sit in the house of God week after week and let this word have zero impact on our hearts and in our minds. Because when we do, guess what happens? We follow those scribes and Pharisees, and one day we'll be just like them saying, what's Pastor Ackland doing to, with all these sinners on a Monday? 
He's got the AA Anonymous in this place. Well, what would Jesus do? Jesus would, Jesus would open all the doors and say, come on in. And we're not going to party and talk about our, our lewdness and our drunkenness and our past, but I'm going to talk to you about the love of Jesus Christ. So invite them all in. Have them all come over. But make sure we keep that focus on Jesus because he's the only one that can save their lives. So don't forget where you came from. Don't ever forget. Talk about your testimony every once in a while. Share it with a friend. Share it with your children. Let them know where you came from. You don't have to go into graphic detail. Just share. I was lost, but now I'm found, praise God. Share, share that every day for the next 365 days this year. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was lost, but now I'm found. Praise God, hallelujah. That's a good way to start. How about you then find someone? You pray for the lost. I prayed for my dad for 22 years. 22 years. My mom taught me to pray for him after a really bad divorce. He said, we forgive and we pray. And we forgive and we pray. And we forgive and we pray every day until what we pray for happens. Because we're praying God's will. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so one day, I'm, I'm in, in my dad's office with my brother, and my wife's there. She's probably pregnant. And, and, <laughs> and we wrestle with my dad verbally for eight hours. Eight hours. My dad says, ah, God can't sit, save me. I'm a sinner. I'm, a, I'm the worst of the worst. I'm like, Dad, he forgave Paul. Paul's pretty bad. I mean, if he can save a, a wretch like Paul, he can save you. And we talked to him. Literally, we, we had a wrestling, verbal wrestling match. And I did mo I'm a preacher, so I did most of the preaching. And then my brother spoke up. And he's just the soft, gentle rugby player. And he goes, Dad? He goes, if Jesus' blood is good enough for me, it's good enough for you. And my dad just, I could tell in that moment of time, he believed. Folks, pray for the lost. Don't ever stop praying. It's on that last prayer that the person will come to Christ. It's like you've worked hard your whole life, and Jesus said if you ask, then you shall receive. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Don't grow weary in well-doing, because if, if you don't grow weary in well-doing, what's the Bible say? The right time you'll reap if you do not faint. Share the gospel. Be active with your faith. Again, if all you know is the name of Jesus, that's good enough. Name of Jesus, darkness flees. Name of Jesus, sick or raised. The name of Jesus, the demoniac is set free. The name of Jesus, the sinner is saved. The name of Jesus, the blind receive their sight. The name of Jesus, the lame walk. The name of Jesus, people full of cancer are set free in an instant at the name of Jesus. I've seen Jesus do these things, folks. It's not just a hearsay and a, a speech. It's Jesus has healed people of stage four cancer straight up. And the doctors are in awe and wonder. I have no clue how this person has been set free. I've been over in the Middle East and, and, and been in a time of prayer where I've seen Muslims come down and knock on the door and say, we heard that you guys were secretly meeting here. And we're like, no one's supposed to know that. <laughs> and three Muslim men said, can you tell me about Yeshua, Isa Masihi? Yeshua is what they say in Hebrew. Isa is what they say in Arabic. Isa Masihi. Can you tell us about Jesus, the Messiah? And then I go and I get the parallel Hebrew-English Bible, and we begin to read the red letters, the words of Jesus. And then these Muslims take these Bibles, and they're excited and all heaven is erupting. Is there anything too difficult for Jesus? I know sometimes we get down. I mean, the recession's bad. COVID's pretty bad. You know, there's a lot of bad things in the world. Jesus said, take hope. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus said when he died on the cross, he said, it was finished. What did that mean? That Jesus' name is a name above every name and that whatever you come 
a cross in this world, and you can call it any kind of trouble, cancer trouble, financial trouble, COVID trouble, hardship trouble. You put a name to that trouble. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. When he died on the cross, he said, it was finished. Ba-boom. Transaction. So let me say to you today, be faithful to God. Saints, be faithful to God. Let the word of God transform your heart and mind every time you come into a place where the Bible is being taught, preached, or teached. And for all my other friends that have not yet believed, is that simple? What are you waiting for? Today is the day of salvation. If you have never put your faith in Jesus, it's, uh, I'll write it, I'll write it and, and guarantee it and sign it because he did with his own blood. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You won't be disappointed. You'll never be the same. But I'll tell you, when my old friends see me, they're like, <laughs> right? Helen Rose, Trader Joe's. I had two guys from high school and they just were saying, holy, but not, yeah. <laughs> they couldn't believe it. Because Jesus transforms a sinner into a saint. And he becomes everything that's good in us. And so when the world says, man, look at that brother, look at that sister, they're so good. Just remind them, the only thing good in me is Jesus. God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You're doing a beautiful work in our life, in our families' lives. You're doing a beautiful work at Crossroads. God, I thank you for what you're doing at Dayspring. God, I just pray for Dayspring right now, God, as the, a new wave of students and a new wave of parents and teachers come into this place where they're going to be discipled and taught the good news of Jesus Christ every day for the next year. God, I pray for a revival to break out in the hearts and the minds of these young students. God, I pray that these teachers will catch a fire for the presence and passion and word of God. Lord, I pray that your name, Jesus, will be on their lips, on their minds, and their hearts, and that they will believe you for the impossible. They'll teach these young kids how to pray dangerous, faithful prayers that will shake this area and affect the kingdom of God for your glory. God, help us to engage and help us to respond rightly to you. God, just pray for anyone here today that's struggling with uh, oppression from the enemy. Right now, I speak the name of Jesus over their lives. Set them free right now, Jesus. God, I, I pray for anyone that's battling cancer. God, would you speak to that cancer and rebuke it in the name of Jesus? God, I pray for testimonies of your faithfulness through the power of your name, Jesus, that you are the God that saves the sinners, that you forgive all our sins and you heal all your diseases and that you are not a man that you should lie, but you are God. You are faithful and true to the end and you work everything, absolutely everything, together for good to those that love you. So Lord, bless your people. Keep your people cause your face to shine upon your people. Grant them your peace and your presence in Jesus' name. Amen.